Thanks for the opportunity to present. Steve Wiedemann is my name. I'm the chair of the LCA Technical Advisory Group, and we're going to give an update on the workings of the working group over the last 12 months. For those of you who aren't familiar, our goals in the Technical Advisory Group are to promote a level playing field for wool and textiles uh, with respect to environmental assessment. That means comparison on like terms with the right terms, uh, looking at impacts of relevance for all fibres and not only wool, and uh, working from robust science that can be relied on for improving sustainability. Our second goal is positioning wool as a proactive and forward-looking industry with respect to the environment. And we're pursuing that through research and development of new methods, working collaboratively and, and publishing credible science. Now, one of the major activities that uh, the TAG has been working on over a number of years now has been the completion of a full supply chain LCA. And that has been published just this month. Uh, we're very pleased to note. And uh, that covers the full cradle to grave impacts of a 300 gram merino sweater made from Australian wool processed in China and sold and worn in the EU market. It's one of the, the few published studies looking at a full supply chain uh, for a garment with, with detailed data behind it. And that study has shown something that we've been aware of the significance of for quite a while, and that is the number of times that a garment gets used. The results of that study were ultimately reported per wear of a sweater. And, uh, and, and as you can imagine, uh, those impacts are therefore highly influenced by how many times that garment is worn. The more times the garment's worn, the more it, uh, it, it reduces the impact of producing that fibre and manufacturing that garment as it's uh, worn over more and more uses. That study has really positioned us well to understand some of the key impacts from wool, uh, particularly our focus in that study was on greenhouse gas emissions, on water stress and on fossil energy demand. And it's put us in what we would call an, a knowledge powerful position about our own supply chain and understanding our own impacts. That's been of critical importance as we've looked to engage in the marketplace and, and in the areas where um, the environmental credentials of garments are really being tested and uh, explored in the market context. And uh, the the principal area of focus for us in that respect has been in the last uh, 12 months and uh, will be for the next couple of years is in a system that's been developed by the, the EU uh, called the Product Environmental Footprint System. Now this is expected to become the most influential market facing reporting system for reporting on the environmental credentials of uh, textiles. And not textiles only, it's economy wide. So anything that's traded uh, will be able to be assessed under this system. And at least for some uh, countries and member states, such as France, uh, it's expected that this will be adopted and enshrined even in legislation uh, soon after it's released in 2021-22. And so this underpins the capability of uh, communicating um, at point of sale with labels um, on the environmental credentials of products. PEF is a sort of one system to rule them all. The, the, the design is to have a, a government um, mandated and, and governed system in order to, uh, to stop the, the, the proliferation of uh, systems that exist. And, and in that sense, we'd expect it to supersede things like the French Adamay system and uh, the SAC HIG index and, and system um, will, will largely be uh, superseded or, or be rolled into the PEF one way or another. In terms of progress, that's working from the, uh, what they call the transition phase at the moment as it moves towards rollout. It's been under development for almost 10 years now. So it's a very robust system, but our engagement has particularly ramped up in the last 12 months. 
And the primary areas that we're engaged in uh, are what's called the development of category rules, and that's specific to textiles. Uh, and that group, as you can see, uh, is made up of a number of really big brands. It's been coordinated by um, the SAC and, um, and, and uh, has a real, I guess, a bit of a who's who uh, of brands involved uh, in that system, but also a number of NGOs and other um, industry groups like Cotton Inc. as well. Now, the EU PEF has some uh, advantages. Uh, one is it's a, a government-led and initiated system, uh, so we think that the principles are better and more robust, for example, than the, the previous engagement we had with SAC, who were a, uh, an NGO, and, and, um, and we also appreciate in this system that it's inclusive of the use phase of garments and also the end of life, so that's uh, included from the beginning. It's also quite comprehensive. It covers 16 impact categories. Uh, and while we'd like to see more even, uh, and particularly the inclusion of microplastics, which aren't currently included, uh, nonetheless, it's, it's quite comprehensive. Uh, our studies to date um, have focused on a few categories of particular relevance, climate change, water stress, uh, fossil energy, for example. We've also done some at least scoping level work on some of the toxicity indicators and on eutrophication indicators. But there are a range that we haven't done uh, an extensive amount of work on uh, to date in the tag, not to say that other areas in the industry, other, other players might not have done some work in this. Uh, but the, I guess the main take home point is it's quite comprehensive in terms of the impact categories. Uh, that can be a good thing, but it can also be a challenge because there's new areas in here where uh, the research hasn't been done in any detail to date. At present, we see that there is a risk, a risk from point of sale labelling of garments and particularly a risk that uh, wool may not score well. Now, having said that, there hasn't been any studies uh, that have been completed studying wool or anything else. Uh, so we don't know categorically how wool will score. It's a different system to what we're, we've used to date. Um, but we do know that some of the uh, initial modelling shows that um, impact categories that are quite high for wool, such as greenhouse gas, are weighted quite heavily in the PEF system. Uh, and I'll go on to explain further, but uh, although there are these uh, 16 impact categories, very broad, quite complex, they also have developed the system for boiling that down into a single score. And uh, of course, the approach that they use to do that is, um, is a key sort of method issue with the whole study is, is how it weights the relative importance of greenhouse gas versus toxicity, et cetera. Uh, and what we do know is the weighting for issues such as greenhouse gas is quite high. So uh, that's a challenge for wool. Having said that, we don't yet have a really good appreciation how those impacts are going to play out for competitive uh, competitive fibres. So it's a little bit of an unknown and yet, but we have to treat it as a uh, potential risk. To understand this further, we've been conducting preliminary analysis of wool supply chains. This is based on the integrated LCA, the full cradle to grave LCA I mentioned before, um, by expanding that out and looking at the additional impact categories. Uh, the preliminary results at the moment only produced really in the last uh, couple of weeks and uh, there's quite some uncertainty around those other impact categories. But having said that, it's, quite, it's nonetheless important to get a first take on, uh, on how the results might look for wool. These results show where the contributions are coming from a wool sweater, as I mentioned before. And uh, perhaps not surprisingly, the biggest contribution is coming from climate change or greenhouse gas emissions. Second to that is impacts from land occupation. And that's a new category that we're not as 
familiar with the particular way that that method is applied. So it's an area we need to understand more thoroughly. Impacts from water stress, interestingly, were also relatively high um, and uh, fossil fuel use was also reasonably significant. For that woolen sweater, as mentioned, uh, farming contributed about half the impact. So uh, that's been in line with our previous work where uh, whichever way you look at this, the production of wool at the farm stage is an important consideration. And any system like this is going to be relevant right back to the farm level. Now, our engagement is at multiple levels, but the first one is assessing whether the system works, if you like, whether particular methods that they've identified suit, um, suit wool in particular. And, and the first uh, issue that we've seen there is in the, the methods they've selected for allocating between wool and meat, an area that uh, we've previously done quite a lot of research in and uh, our analysis suggests that they've got some errors in that method that are a disadvantageous for wool. So certainly our, um, our recommendations will be to, uh, to change those methods and to improve them. And we think that as a result, the impacts for wool may come down 20% compared to where they would be otherwise. Uh, another area will be investigating some of these new impact categories, I mentioned particularly land use, and also um, really uh, understanding and, and ramping up our efforts in areas that we do know, such as greenhouse gas emissions, particularly at the farm stage, and some new work looking into that and, and new um, impact assessment methods for greenhouse gas, such as the, the GWP STAR method, which uh, hold some opportunity there for re-evaluating the impact of methane in particular. And lastly, uh, an area of engagement is around advocating for regionally relevant methods. Uh, so for example, being a European system, there is a temptation to use European methods for assessing, let's say, nutrient losses at the farm stage. But of course, European conditions and Australian conditions, South African conditions, Argentinian conditions, New Zealand conditions are really quite different to, to Europe. And uh, it's very important that um, it's possible under this system to use methods that suit those countries of origin when farming is such a big and important contributor to the impacts from war. In addition to that, our work is focusing on really being able to reward, if you like, long-lived products such as wool uh, through better data and better assumptions around garment function. Thermal properties and garment durability are, are all areas that we're investigating and trying to build a method and promote a method that really um, accounts for these correctly and um, credits them where uh, garments perform better. And uh, it's fair to say as well, taking due consideration and account for the weaknesses of other fibre types and the weaknesses of other um, fashion types, so fast fashion, et cetera. Uh, and that would include uh, promoting the inclusion of microplastics, which while they can't get rolled into the single score at this stage, uh, they can be um, included nonetheless in the, in the method and uh, assessed and reported as additional information. We think that that's important that that's included. And also to address, um, I, I guess, particular fashion types that promote very short-lived garments. Is, uh, I guess we'd say wool has done its homework. Uh, we're understanding and addressing the hotspots uh, such as climate change. And uh, our work is now focused on engaging with this EU PEF system uh, which, as I mentioned, we expect to become the most uh, influential system, not only in Europe, but potentially beyond that, as it gains dominance and, and is, is more widely accepted beyond 2021. Uh, our work in that space is advocating for robust science for the right methods to not disadvantage wool in comparison to other fibre types. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present and uh, I'm very happy to take uh, follow-up questions if you'd like to email me. My details are there. Thank you very much.